Man, it is good to be with each and every single one of you. I don't know where you're joining from, whether you're here at our 48th Street campus or you're joining us from Macomb, Kirksville, 929, Pike County, Hannibal, Lima, Mount Sterling, Keokuk, Monmouth, Jacksonville, online, inside. We are so incredibly thankful for you. I heard a story uh, that it might be happening this weekend that a person who's been watching us online is going to be driving in and getting baptized at one of our locations. So if it happens to be at your location, make sure you cheer super loud. That'll be a big win. And we will be working diligently to try and find them a church home in their area where they can serve and participate. If you are brand new to The Crossing, we are so glad that you're here. And uh, make sure you connect with a campus pastor or one of your incredible staff members or difference makers before you leave because we would love an opportunity to love you well. And to get connected, one of the easy ways to do that is there's a QR code on the seat in front of you. If you pull out your camera, click on that, it'll open up and allow you to actually fill out some information and kind of raise your hand and say, hey, I was here and I'd love to get connected. Before I jump into this sermon series, as promised, um, we are getting ready to embark on a brand new sermon series starting next weekend. That sermon series is called Weeds in My Garden, a series on being honest about mental health. And we will be talking about suicide, self-harm, stress, anxiety, burnout, low self-esteem, and depression. And I, like I said this a couple weeks ago, I believe that these next 12 weeks of our church will be the uh, most important messages that we will preach this entire year. There's a couple things that you can do to help us out as we get ready for that. I already mentioned the QR code, but if you click on that QR code that's in front of all your seats, and you can do this while I'm preaching. You're not going to even frustrate me. I'm going to love it if I see phones out. You can click on that. It'll pull up a link tree, and there is a mental health survey. I would love all of you to take it, every single one of you. Uh, what it's going to do, it's going to take you 30 seconds. First question, how old are you? That's easy because you should remember that, Okay. If you don't remember how old you are, click 80, okay? Then after that, you're going to say, hey, are you a male or female? Super easy. Third question um, is, which one of these things have you wrestled with uh, in the last 12 months? And it's perfectly reasonable for you to click none. Say, Clayton, I haven't had to navigate any of these issues personally in the last 12 months. There's some nuns in here at all of our locations. I want you to raise your hand and acknowledge yourself. And, but you can click all the ones that account for you. Then the next question is, do you know anybody who does? And then you're done. It's like super easy. But what it's going to do is it's going to help us as we prepare this message to be able to, um, to lean in, draw some information. We're not going to get like who your name is. We're not going to send you a, hey, man, thanks for being so honest about it's none of that stuff. Uh, we don't track it, but it will help me uh, help you a whole lot better. So if you like us, help us out. Okay? Now, parents. During this sermon series, if you have uh, really young kids, uh, elementary age kids, I'm going to really ask you to do uh, myself and the people around you a huge favor and yourself a huge favor and take advantage of our incredible kids programming. I'm going to ask you to do that for a couple of reasons. Now, you may have a sixth grader who, and you have a fuse. Take full advantage of that with your junior hires. If you don't, they're going to be fine in the auditorium. Your high school students, I'd love for your high school kids to be sitting with you in the auditorium as we go through the sermon series. I just don't want to put ideas in your really young kids' heads. I want to put you in a position to lead first before they start asking you questions. Second thing is, is just, just a general rule, your kids will always learn better in one of our kids' environments than they will in here. Um, you know, I know some of you think I'm great, but I'm not that great. I cannot appeal to five-year-olds all the way to wherever you are. It's just not going to happen. Your kid will always learn more about Jesus, and that should be your goal as a parent. How do I put my kid in incredible environments for them to learn about Jesus? Your kid will always learn about Jesus better in all of our kids' environments. And the third reason is I want you to be a good neighbor. There are going to be people who are going to be sitting around you who are going to be clinging on for dear life during this sermon series. And I don't want your kid to be a distraction from the, the help and the hope that they need. Is that a fair deal? Okay. All right. Perfect. Now, uh, we are in the last week of a sermon series called The Other Side. The first week Jerry talked about heaven. We learn that heaven is a real place, that we will be changed and freed from all of the baggage of the lower story. Then last week we talked about hell. We learned that hell is real, that Jesus talked about it more than any other biblical uh, writer combined. We learned that it is a forever place and it is a place of punishment and torment. But we also learned that by God's grace and unfailing love, he sent Jesus 
Christ to pay the price that we could never pay. And that when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need not worry about the horrors of hell because heaven awaits you when you die. And if you missed any of those or you want to pick up on other sermons from the past, you can go to our website or you can go to YouTube. Our our, uh, website is thecrossing.net. Our YouTube is One Crossing. If you see this little insignia, our logo, you'll know you're at the right place. And you can always rewatch our sermons. Or if you liked one when Jerry preaches on Sunday and you want to rewatch it again on Monday, on Monday mornings all of our sermons are loaded so you guys can uh, take advantage of that. Or you have to be careful about this. If you know somebody that could use a particular message, it's a great way to share it because you can just text it to them and they can just watch it on their phone when they're supposed to be working, okay? All right, that being said, uh, if you grew up in a church or maybe hung around with church people, you may have heard that one day we are going to be judged. And there's a lot of misinformation about what judgment looks like. And so today, we're going to be talking about the two judgments. And if you spend any time reading uh, your Bible, when you start reading about the judgment, sometimes, and I'm saying this as a person who reads his Bible, it can be a little confusing. Um, let me explain. You're in your Bible, you're reading like a good Christian, and you come across Ephesians chapter 2, uh, and this is what it says, okay? As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the, of the ruler of the kingdom of the air and the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Okay, this is not the cheer me up portion of the sermon. He lays out seven indictments on the human soul. Ready, here's the first one. You were dead through your transgressions and sins. Next one. You walked in them as a way of life. Third one, you followed the ways of this world. Four, you followed the evil ruler. Five, you shared the attitude or spirit of disobedient men. Six, we all lived by the passions of the flesh. Seven, we followed the desires of the body and the mind. He is saying, you and I are in a really bad spot. We deserve wrath. Then it gets to the good part. Look what happens. He's setting the stage to say, this is how bad it is, but look at how good it gets. But because of his, this is God, God, great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Hear me, never doubt the expanse of God's love. If you were to take all of the love for all of humanity, for all of human history, it would only fill a Coke can compared to the ocean of God's love. We are all saved by grace, and we lay hold of that salvation through faith. It's not something you earn. It's not something we do. It's not something we create. It is something we receive. This is echoed in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Look what he says. He saved us. This is God. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his, this is God's mercy, 
God saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. So you have this huge thrust in Scripture that says God is the one who saves you. That our heavenly reward is coming from God because of us simply laying hold of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. So when you read through things like this, you're going, it has nothing to do with our works. It has everything to do with what Jesus did on our behalf. And so you've got this entire line of thinking over here, right? And then you come across verses like this. God will repay each person according to what they have done. And if you're like me, you go, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. Because if you were to like track the good things that I've done versus the bad things that I've done, it wouldn't be pretty. Especially when you read that nothing is hidden from God. Everything is laid bare and we have to give an account. Like I'm a good Christian, which means I can fake it right? Like someone can be mean to me, and I can be like, God bless you. But on the inside, I'll kill you, (laughs) right? And then you read in your Bible that if a man even thinks it in his heart, uh uh-oh. So Clayton, help me out here. Scripture's talking about all, that we are saved through Jesus, but somewhere along the line, we're going to have to pay a bill. He's keeping track. The reason it doesn't sound good and the reason it doesn't sound right is because when we are looking at Scripture, we're looking at two separate things, that no matter how good I am, I can never earn my salvation, But God is also gonna repay us according to what we have done. How does this work out? The reason these verses do not make sense at first glance is because they are talking about two different judgments. You and I will face two different and separate judgments. The first one is the great white throne And the second one is the judgment seat of Christ. The easiest way to understand these two judgments is to think of them as having to answer two different questions. In other words, there's going to be a test. And some of you went, "Uh uh-oh. How many of you at all of our locations, you were great test takers in school? Okay. All right, now I know who we're reaching here at the crossing, okay? God bless you. You can still keep coming, okay? And I'm guessing all the rest of you, you were not a good test taker in school. It's a good thing I'm preaching this sermon then, okay? Because I'm going to give you the answers to the test, okay? Now, uh, here's what you need to know. When I was in school, uh, by God's grace, I was actually a good test taker. I need to not pretend like I can identify with you. I was actually a really good test taker. I was actually one of those freaks who could stay up late the night before, cram for my work, and I could walk into class and I could nail it. Um, To give you a little perspective, when I was in my final year of Bible college, so you go to Bible college for four years and you get a, a degree in biblical literature, but you could go for five years, do 150 credit hours, and it basically gave you a bachelor's in theology, which puts you a long way into your master's. And going into my final fifth year of Bible college, the the crossing asked me if I wanted to be the youth pastor here. And I was still going to school in Joplin, Missouri, which was six hours away. This is before the four lanes went through Camden and Lake of the Ozarks, okay? This is back when it was two lanes to purgatory, okay? And so on Friday afternoons, I would leave school and I would drive all the way up here and I'd be the youth minister on Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. And then on Monday at noon, I would drive back to school. My senior year of college, I took 44 credit hours. I took 24 hours in the first semester, and I took 20 hours in the second semester. So I did a year and a half of school in my final year with a one-way commute of six hours. Now, I was able to handle all of that except for one thing that has always been my Achilles heel, languages. 
If you've listened to me for a while, you know that sometimes I'll just be talking and the wrong word just comes out of my mouth. That's just how it is. I don't even understand English, okay? It's just, it's just what it is. And I was horrible, horrible, always have been at foreign language. And one of the classes I had to take was Greek, and I understood all of the vocab, but I understood none of the rules. And by God's grace, there was a professor who really liked me. And uh, at the end of the quizzes, it would say, what size shoe is Clayton Hensel wearing? And I was like, I know the answer to that. <laughs> and it was, how many points did Clayton Hensel score in the basketball game? And I'm like, I know the answer to that one too. And that is how I passed Greek, okay? Now, uh, what was even worse than uh, Greek was Spanish. I was, oh, God-awful horrible at Spanish. Uh, I tried to make my Spanish name Jorge, and then I tried to change it to Zorro in class. My Spanish teacher was not going to call me Zorro, even though I signed all my papers with a Z, and I turned them in. That was as far as I could get into Spanish, is just putting a Z on a paper. And, uh, but I, the problem with me is I didn't know how bad I was at Spanish. And so I was doing some ministry work on weekends, and I would go to Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, when I was in Bible college. And we'd go down and we'd minister to people, and uh, I've kind of got an outgoing personality. And so I would go up to people, and I would say, what's up, my dog? Except I would say it in Spanish. And this was back when you said, what's up, my dog, because that was cool. And so I'd be coming out of a quick trip, and I'd, I'd see a bunch of people who spoke Spanish. And I'd be like, what's up, my dog? Except I would do it in Spanish. And uh, this is what you're supposed to say. You're supposed to say, que pasa mi perro? And you want to roll the R, and that's incredibly important. Um, uh, the problem is, I wasn't very good at that. And um, I did this for months. And then I was sitting across the table from a good friend who, was, um, who spoke fluent Spanish because, uh, well, it's his native language. And uh, I said, you know, he sat down and I, I said, que pasa mi perro? And he goes, say that again? Because what I was actually saying, because I couldn't roll my R, is what's up my butt? <laughs> and so all over... All over Tulsa, Oklahoma, there was a big, chunky white boy walking around. What's up, my butt? What is up, my butt? Hey, amigo, donde esta? Oh, what is up, my butt? So, it's so important <laughs> that if, you, if there's going to be a test that we get the answers right. All right? You guys ready? Now you're, you're tuned in now. Okay. So... Uh, here's what we need to know. We can prepare for the test. So uh, let me set up the scene. Your life can be broken down into three sections. Life now, life in between, and life forever. We are living in life now. When we die, we go to life in between. In the Old Testament, that's called Sheol. In the New Testament, uh, believers go to paradise, and non-believers go to Hades. Paradise is not, uh, is not heaven. Hades is not hell. So if I were to die today, I would either go to paradise or I would go to Hades. I would not go any other place. I'm not in heaven. I'm not in hell. That is life in between. Then upon the final judgment, when God makes everything new, those in Christ will receive glorified bodies and God will create a new heaven and a new earth. And those in Hades will be sent to hell, and those in paradise will receive their eternal reward. When you die, your body and soul are separated. So my body goes into the urn or the casket, but my soul goes to either paradise with God the Father, Jesus the Son, or it goes into Hades. You are whisked away at the moment of your death to the first judgment which determines whether or not you go to paradise or you go to Hades. And the question at the great white throne of judgment is simply this. What did you do with my son Jesus? That's the question that God is going to ask you. What did you do with my son Jesus? This is a question about salvation. Revelation chapter 20, look what it says. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded 
in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is hell. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So, for believers, we are united with Christ in the intermediate state. Paul tells us that to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. And those who don't want Jesus to pay for their sins can pay for their sins on their own. That is what hell is. It is an eternal payment for sins committed against an eternal God. And some of you might be going, I'm not okay with a God who sends people to hell. And I get that. That makes sense logically. But I need you to take another look at this. I would tell you that that is not really how it goes down. God is a God of love. It's one of his preeminent qualities. His love and his holiness are two competing primary uh, characteristics of who he is. And love requires a choice. God will not force himself on you. He will not coerce you against your will. He wants, if you want to live forever without him, he will honor your choice. The correct answer to the question, what did you do with my son Jesus, is this. I gave my life to him. That's what I did. I made Jesus my savior and my Lord. I surrendered the castle of my life to the kingship of Jesus. Here at the crossing, we call that an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And you start that relationship when you believe that Jesus exists, that he is the son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins, that he rose three days later and that he ascended into heaven. And in that moment, you stop living for yourself and you start living for him, and you become a member of his kingdom, and you pursue his purposes for your life. And then the very next thing that you do is you get baptized. It symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of what Jesus did on our behalf. It represents the washing away of your sins and your rebirth into the family of God. I said this last week, and I know there's some of you who are wondering about maybe you were sprinkled as a baby. Every time the Bible talks about baptism, it talks about immersion. Baptism means to dunk or submerge. Sprinkling as a form of baptism is foreign to the biblical text. And if you don't believe me, uh, look for it yourself. Secondly, your decision to be baptized needs to be your decision, not your parents. It's great that your parents had faith and wanted you to grow up to follow the Lord, And you are doing, in my opinion, the very best thing when you choose to honor that decision when you grow older. That when you choose to get baptized, you are cashing the spiritual check that your parents wrote for you when you were an infant. It is the natural fulfillment uh, of their desire to dedicate you to the Lord in the first place. Now hear me carefully. Getting baptized And not living out your commitment to Christ is not what Christ desires. Baptism does not save you. Jesus saves you. There are people in scripture who did all kinds of good works, but Jesus says to them, away from me. I never knew you. It must be an intimate, personal relationship. And when you get baptized and you begin to follow God, your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. And when you die and you go to uh, the judgment, there's all the books of all the deeds that you have done. And then there is the Lamb's book of life. And if your name is found in the Lamb's book of life, you go to paradise to be with Jesus and God the Father. And if your name is not in the Lamb's book of life, you go to Hades and hell is your future. Then one day, when Jesus returns to earth and God creates a new heaven and a new earth, we will find ourselves at the judgment seat of Christ. This is the second judgment that we will face. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. The word judgment seat, uh, the word there is bima. It's the bima seat. It stands for a raised platform. It's where a, a runners would be judged or receive their crown. Think of it as first, second, and third place at a wrestling meet, or gold, silver, and bronze at the Olympics. It's where you stand and you receive the reward for what you have done. If you ran the fastest, you get the gold. If you ran second fastest, you get the silver. If you ran third fastest, you and if you're chunky, you watched online, okay? That's what you did. You're like, this running thing's not for me. It is at this Bema seat, the second judgment, that we will be asked the second question. Here's the question. In light of Jesus, what did you do with what I gave you? This question is not about heaven or hell. That's what the first question was about. This question is about what will heaven be like for you? Recently, all of us campus pastors went down to a St. Louis Cardinals game. And I am pretty confident that the hot dogs cost more than the seats. Okay, so like we were at the game, it was better than work. But boy, was it hot. And when the sun wasn't in your eye, you could see the game. You really could. And had the wind blown, it would have, uh, you know, made it not miserable. And make us all long for the glory of heaven. And make us all fear the horrors of hell. Like we were at the game. But you could see that there were some people who had box seats. And I got nachos for like 38 bucks. And I was like, this is, I would have much rather had a nicer seat. I got to be honest with you. And I'll, be, I'll tell you what I did. About the sixth inning, you may have done this. It's not right. I tried to find other people's seats that didn't appreciate them and sit there. And you know how you have to find, like, oh, that's a nice seat in the shade. And, oh, boy, that's, you know, I'll sit, I'll sit here. And then you, like, every person who's coming, like, down the steps, you try to pretend, like, oh, is this, is this, no, it's not, it's not, oh, it is yours? I'm so sorry. I, oh, where's my ticket? I'm sorry, uh, yeah, wrong row, <laughs> right? You're trying to sit in a different seat because you're at the game, but your seats aren't all that great. Uh, you can see the game whenever the sun's not in your eyes. It's one of those kind of setups. This question is all about lordship. This question is about what did you do with your time, your talents, and your abilities. This question is about how you leveraged your money and how you opened your home and how you used your time. This question is about how you used your gifts and whether you used it for your glory and your mission or God's glory and God's mission. I know for some of you this is kind of hard to take in, but when you reread scripture, you will see this kind of talk everywhere in scripture that God has the intent to reward you in heaven for the work you did here on earth. He's gonna bless you. He's gonna upgrade your seats, okay? So are you in heaven? Yes. But he's actually given you and I a chance to like kind of pick the heaven we have. You're going, Clayton, this is far-fetched. You ready? You ready? Here we go. Uh, when Jesus is talking about prayer, he says, don't babble on the street corners like the pagans do. Instead, close the door and pray, and your father who sees what is done in secret will re reward you. Oh. oh. How about this one? Oh, when you fast, when you choose not to eat to focus your mind on spiritual things, don't make a big deal about it. Put some hair gel on, go to work, don't talk about how hungry you are, and boy, it's been a long time. Woo, what I'd give for a cheeseburger. Shut up. Just be hungry for Jesus. And your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Uh, look at this one, Luke chapter 6. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Pause. Some of you like to quote this verse. 
But the reason people are mean to you is not because of Jesus. It's because you're mean. You're a crank. Ask your husband, okay? Hear me. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying when people do this because of Jesus, when you take a stand because of him and people revile you because of your allegiance to Christ, check out what God does. Let's keep going in the text. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your in. Hold on a second. When you give to the poor, you're not supposed to let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. This is about when it comes time to give to the poor. And guess what God says? Because your father, who sees what you do, will reward you. Don't shout about it. He even says this. Don't shout about it and make a big deal and print a really big check. When you do that, he says, you have already received your reward in full. You got your reward here on earth. But if you just bless the socks off of people and don't make a big deal about it, God's upstairs going, ooh boy, have I got something in store for you. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. The right answer to that second question is this. I poured out my life as a living sacrifice to bring glory to God, to love my neighbors, to reach the lost, and disciple the saved. I took the talents that you gave me and I used them to serve people and point people to Jesus. I took the money that you gave me and I used it to advance your church and your kingdom. I used my time and I invested it in people and kingdom causes. I took my words and I used them to pray to you and I prayed to you on behalf of others and I used my words to share the good news of your son Jesus. And Jesus is serious about rewarding you. Because look what he says at the very back of your Bible. Go home, turn to the back, or if you're, you know, an iPhone user, scroll to the bottom. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 22. Last book. This is Jesus. This will be in red letters. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. This is like the Santa Claus verse. This is him saying, I've been watching you. Ooh, you did that, I got a reward for that. Oh, you did that, I got a reward for that. My reward is coming with me and I will give to each person according to what they have done. What you and I do matters. So let me encourage you to pour out your life as a living sacrifice. May we echo the words of Paul in 2 Timothy chapter four. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. God takes note and is planning on rewarding every act that you and I did to advance his cause and his kingdom. He is gonna ask you, what did you do with all that I gave you in light of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross? And I want every single one of us to be ready to answer that question. We're moving to a time of decision. I'm gonna do something I don't normally do. Don't freak out, don't blog about it. But I'm gonna quote Confucius. And I know that quoting Confucius in a church setting is a little weird. But this is one of my favorite quotes. Like I think about it all the time. This is what he says. Every man has two lives. And the first one, begin, or the second one starts when he realizes he only has one. Every man has two lives, and the second one starts when he realizes he only has one. There are some of you right now 
who have never started an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you're brand new to the crossing. Maybe somebody brought you. Maybe somebody's been praying for you. Uh, I don't know the specifics of how you found yourself here listening to this moment right now, whether in this room or watching online. But Jesus Christ died on your behalf, not just to save you from hell, but to also give you new life in him. We read at the very beginning of my message that you were created by God to do good works, which he prepared in advance for you to do. That there is an aspect of your life that you will never fully understand, that you will never fully appreciate until you are in relationship with him. That there is this spiritual potential that lies dormant in each and every single one of us. Your God-ordained, created purpose is only found in Christ. And if you are uh, here listening to this message today and you have never started an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you not to put it off any longer. Maybe for the past two weeks you've heard about being baptized and you've never been baptized. I want to encourage you not to put that off any longer. And in just a few moments, the people around you are going to stand and they're going to start singing. And I'm going to encourage you to come up here to the front. There's going to be a pastor over by the baptistry who would love a chance to answer some of your questions and talk to you about what it means to have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. To the rest of you in the room, those of you who already have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the second life begins when you realize you only have one. So how are you going to spend it? I don't know how much time I have left. I don't know how many sunrises I'm going to see. I don't know how many more sunsets I'm going to get to enjoy. You don't either. This is the only one we have. This is the only life that we get to make a difference. This is the only life we get to be on mission and to glorify God in helping people find a relationship with him. And what I want to encourage you to do is pour yourself out. If you're not serving, start serving. If you're not giving, start giving. If you're not reaching, start reaching. If you're not discipling, start discipling. Go, God, this is the one life that I have. And the incentive inside of this is not only are you honoring what Jesus Christ did on the cross by living as a living sacrifice on his behalf, but God is taking note of what you do, whether big or small, and he has every expectation of rewarding you. And I don't want any of us to play it safe when it comes to the rewards of God. Because God is described as the ultimate gift giver. And I don't want any of us to miss out. Would you guys stand with me? Heavenly Father, move in this place. Stir something up in each and every single one of us. Do a work that only you can do. God, in areas where we are clinging more to the ways of this world than to your son Jesus, convict us and strengthen us and give us the ability to let go of the things of this world and take fully a hold of you, of your word and your spirit and your promises. God, help this church in all of its different locations all across this region be full of people who are unashamedly and unapologetically on mission for you. God, help us to be a church that when you look down from heaven, you can't help but smile at how we are trusting in your promises. In your name I pray, amen.